Full effect mode, bun down is the sound. You know how we do. This is the lounge on Twitch. And today, first time ever, I've got co-hosts. What? Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up to my co-host for today. None other than Eloquent and Jake Palumbo. What's up, fellas? What up? Hey. What it do? What it do? Glad to be here. How's everyone doing today? Good, man. It's a beautiful day outside. Um, what better what better way to talk some talk some graps? Yeah, for real. It's not miserable outside for once, so have some coffee and talk some wrestling. There you go. There you go. I can see that I'm the only one that kind of nerded out. I'm wearing my Cody shirt, my mm. my pre WWE uh, Cody shirt. <laughs> but everyone else is, is, is dressed in their in their skivvies today, so it's all gravy. I'm rocking the uh, the Witty Hutton. Shout out oh, to Martin. Hey. Shout out to Brahman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I've got a. I got an FTR shirt that I was wearing yesterday oh, somewhere around the crib. Okay. But okay. I was gonna say I've got wrestling memorabilia all over the crib if I need to put some in the camera. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, man, you're rocking low life. We good. Squeeze up my uh, the old AEW title. And uh, Adam and I got hell of action figures like all around the crib. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, here's how we're going to get things started. Typically on this podcast, we always ask our guests, and both of you have been on the show before. We've asked you this before. How were you introduced to hip hop culture? But for the purposes of today's wrestling edition, Top Ropes and Topes with Eloquent Jake Palumbo, my question to start off today is how were both of you introduced to professional wrestling? Um, I mean, for me, uh, I think I was. The first time I'd seen it was, I mean, I, I would have been four or five. So that would have oh, been wow. back in like 90, 90 91, some, somewhere around there. Um, and, you know, it was just, uh, yeah, just like WWF on, on TV. Um, like I never saw like a pay-per-view for the first time until like you know, like way the way the fuck later. Um I don't know, I just remember um, you know, your the guys like like Piper and and Hogan and Savage and, and those guys. Um and and then later, you know, they would they would show WCW on um like Saturday nights, like way, way back in the day. Um, and I, and I was just, I fell in love with it, um, pretty much immediately. Um, you know, super colorful characters and, you know, at that age, you know, I, I, I thought it was real and I just thought it was the, the, the coolest thing in the world. Um, I mean, my fandom didn't really like sort of climax until much, much later, but yeah, um, yeah, around like 91 or so is definitely where, where it really, really kicked off. Okay. Jake, what do you say? To try and condense, you know, 20 something years into a two minute elevator pitch. Um, <laughs> you know, I saw wrestling for the first time when I was, a, you know, when I was a little kid, like in the late eighties um, and, you know, enjoyed it, but didn't get too deep into it until around 1995 when I'm making kind of the transition into being a tween. And uh, you know, it was a couple things going on, you know, we had the beginning of what would later become the Monday Night Wars. I also, you know, I've lived in Brooklyn for 17 years, you know, basically half my life at this point. But, you know, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm born and raised in East Tennessee. No, I, so, I never tell. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's no way you can tell. Um, but basically, you know, I, I had the misfortune of going to high school in a terrible town called Morristown, Tennessee. But that coincidentally was the town that Jim Cornette happened to run <laughs> Spoken Mountain Wrestling out of because yeah, yeah. it was an untapped territory. It was very, you know, cheap cost of living because everyone was poor. And, you know, it, we didn't find out until years and years later that Rick Rubin was the silent benefactor for <laughs> Smoky Mountain Wrestling. So at that time, I, you know, they had shows every Sunday at uh, Morristown East High School. I also lived down the street from White Lightning Tim Horner. Um, 
as you know, and that's if you've ever heard Jim Cornette's epic rant about how much he hates <laughs> Tim Horner, it's, it's worth your half hour. But anyway, so as time goes on, like, you know, then, you know, a year or two later, I'm, I'm getting into high school and the Monday Night Wars are heating up and I just leapt into wrestling with everything. And we didn't have the Internet yet. And kayfabe was still kind of alive at that point. So. I'm 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 a person that like I invest emotionally into everything I'm doing, whether it's music or watching wrestling or whatever. So, you know, I would get very deeply entrenched in it. Like when Shawn Michaels took the belt off of Bret Hart, like I was crushed for weeks. And so as as time goes on, wrestling just starts seeping its way into my life. Like even my friends and I, we discuss real life issues by using backstage wrestling terminology. <laughs> like if, if one of us goes on it. a date that doesn't go well, we'll come back and be like, yeah, I got jobbed out tonight. And it's, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, if we're making fun of somebody, we'll call them a mid Carter. And, you know, it's, it's so deeply entrenched just into everything I do, but to, to speed up and, and bring us to present day, you know, I moved to New York in 2006 for the purpose of trying to do hip hop. And it was around that time that I kind of started falling out of touch with what was currently going on in wrestling. Like I still tune in for major pay-per-views and, you know, try to keep a foot in. But uh, what later happened is the way that I la I'm able to keep wrestling in my life kind of 365 days a year is the emergence of things like the Conrad Thompson podcasts and the network and, I have the ability that, like, if I don't like what the WWE is doing right now or what AEW is doing right now, I can just immerse myself in some random episode of Mid-South Wrestling from 88 and, you know, not have, kind of exist in this other little ecosystem. So out of touch as I might be, like, wrestling is still 365, you know, part of my day. So I'm never too far away from it. Jake, <clears throat> man, you really hit it on the nail, and I could tell by, you know, my boy Eloquent's reaction here, using terms like kayfabe in your normal everyday speak is very much a real thing. Right. And that's oh, a yeah. shoot, brother. <laughs> oh, I, I I talk about like, oh, man, it's, 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 the student over there didn't put me over. You know, <laughs> right. like, like, yeah. for, no, that's part of like my everyday lingo, yo. Yeah. And, you know, and the homies be looking at me like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, don't, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not in the know, it just sounds like gibberish. You know, right, to the right. outsider, it just sounds like gibberish. But if it's it's almost like a and, and I guess it literally is a coded language because <laughs> it, it, it originated to try to protect the business and to not let you know common folk know what was actually going on. So yeah, I mean, it's I think with most wrestling fans, like it just kind of ingrains itself in you to where it, it, it goes beyond sitting down in front of the TV and being entertained. That carny lexicon is real. It's bad. Okay. It, it's weird because it's like, um, I almost feel like at odds about it sometimes because like. Because we're not like workers? Of, right. And like one, of my, like one of my biggest pet peeves is when, you know, like I'd see wrestling fans online talk about, oh, this dude's a mark. Or some shit, oh. and it's like, oh, that and it's like, and it's like, fam, it's like, you know, like wrestling nerds calling other wrestling nerds wrestling nerds. Yep. Like, come, come on, come on now. But you know, on some level, I feel like you know, uh, like I, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a show and I'll try very hard when I'm just like sitting there with my boy, and you know, I'll try to not refer to people as faces and heels and and stuff like that because it's like well that, that that's that's for them like that's for the the people in the ring but then you know like i like i mentioned before you know i'll, I'll get back home and i'll talk about oh man yo i, I really put that producer over and, <laughs> right. I, and i have to like sort of catch myself like all right all right al you're kind of speaking out of both sides of your mouth <laughs> And on that note, maybe let's just quickly run over some of these terms that we've we've okay. So we brought up a, we brought up a mark, which the definition of a mark is essentially a mark. I mean that I think it translates over into regular life too. Right? Into the regular world, I yeah. think it means about yeah. the same thing. Yeah, you've got kayfabe, right? And kayfabe is essentially, as you mentioned, it's it's uh, 
protecting the business through coded language. I it's guess. an old carnival term, actually. Yeah, it dates back there to the carnival. Yeah, which is obviously the roots of wrestling are obviously that. Right. Um, a shoot is something that's real. A work is something that is pretend. Right. Any anything any words we've thrown out yet that that we haven't. I mean, it. we could go deeper. Like I, yeah, um, we could go nuts. <laughs> no, literally, like um, I used to. I, I know we're gonna get into the music aspect of it later, so I won't go too deep. But you know, I I used to on stage take bumps. You know, like I would finish a verse and like I know how to do a flat back bump, and you know, people in the audience would be like, "Oh my god, you fell and hurt yourself." You know, uh. So as you get older, I had to stop doing that a little bit less. You know, I I really only kind of bring it out for the big shows now. But my point is, is that like, I go home and like, if my knee hurts, I'll be like, well, I hard weighed myself, (laughs) you know, um, it just, (laughs) we could literally go, if we went to Wikipedia to the encyclopedia of terms, like we could probably find the practical application (laughs) for almost every facet of life. Yeah. Yeah. Like for real, for real. Yo, yo, there was a, there was a, you mentioned L what it's like bringing, like when you go to a live show, um, I personally, the, the guys I go with, they're, they're just as, you know, smarty marky about wrestling as I am. So we, we sound like, you know, your typical wrestling geeks at a show. But, you know, if, if my wife happens to be in the room <laughs> when I'm watching wrestling, she's literally looking at me like, you are an alien, man. <laughs> but, I mean, I also think that's almost... I mean, at, at this point, um, you know, I, we've all sort of gone through, at least most of us have gone through that era of like kind of wanting to almost hide or like disguise your fandom a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. um, I mean, nowadays it's like I, I I wear my wrestling fandom like, you know, like on my sleeves. Yeah. Um, but once upon a time, uh, you know, it's like, like when I'm at, when I'm at my, I'm, I'll be at my parents' house and I'll be watching like Raw or SmackDown or something. And, um, you know, like I can convince my dad to watch it with me and he can still like suspend his disbelief. But, you know, like my mom will walk past me and like, oh, I can't believe you're, you're still watching this, 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 this <laughs> thing. This thing's for babies. And it's like, well, it's like, oh, it, it's so fake. Like, look, 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 look. He's not even really hitting them. And it's like, well, well, all. You know that that movie you watched yesterday is fake too. What's the difference? Right. So that lends me to want to ask this question: When you were first introduced to this this obviously infectious form of entertainment, what was it about wrestling, though? Um, I think for for me, um, I mean, I've always just had a love for combat you know, choreographed or otherwise, um, you know, dad's huge into boxing. I've, you know, I'm a big Kung Fu movie fan. Um, and you know, and that, and wrestling is sort of cut from that same cloth. And it's like, you know, the same things that we enjoy in movies and superhero TV shows and things like that. I mean, I mean, we're talking about terminology and, and and the language. I mean, you can sort of you can sort of apply all of that to any other form of like TV or 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 whatever the the, the medium is. Ultimately, you know, these are just stories about good guys versus bad guys and good conquering evil. And I think that's that's something that's timeless and everyone can can gravitate to. I mean. You know, a lot of people might find wrestling silly or hard to hard to believe, but ultimately those principles are, are still the same. And so, you know, especially in the um, late '80s, early '90s, where you know, like all of the wrestlers and were were characters, and they were so over the top. Um, you know, like what's the difference between that and I don't know. Batman or Superman or something like that, right? I hate, I hate. What about you, Jake? To build on what Elle said, you know, I mean, the reason that we attach ourselves to these things is because, you know, wrestlers are superheroes. Wrestlers are a larger-than-life persona. And I think 
and, and the same as he said that people identify with Batman or, you know, with any fictitious character, the reason people connect is because there's something in that character that they find applicable to themselves and what they're going through in real life. So when I was a displaced teenager in America, you know, dealing with, you know, uh, whatever issues I was dealing with at, in high school at the time, like I would watch Bret Hart on television and feel like he was almost shouldering my problems and yep. was giving me like a blueprint on how to handle it because I was a person who, you know, prided himself on details and technical precision and trying to do the right thing and fill in the blank and fill in the blank. In that same aspect, I related to Ric Flair because I'm also a raving lunatic who <laughs> make bad decisions and then try to clean up the aftermath. But so saying that to say is that like in the same way that when I when you know when I was 16 years old, I, I told my parents I wanted Wu Tang Forever for my birthday, and they got it for me. And I'm I, I'm I'm viewing Wu Tang as this like crew of Avengers who had my back, right. you know, that that made me feel less fearful in certain situations. Well, wrestlers were applicable the same way. And again, we'll get to this later. But when I started doing hip hop, it fell perfectly into place because you're playing a character that's an exaggerated version of your real self. So mm -hmm. I to this day, as a 40 year old man. Like I still go through life like applying Terry Funk or Bret Hart or, you know, these people that I look up to to what I'm currently going through. Like that's something that I don't think will ever go away. Um, you know, there's always going to be something that happened in wrestling that's applicable to what you're going through right now. Oh, and, yeah. And, as, as we said before, like if you're not in the know, that's going to sound so strange and unusual to the outsider. But, right. yeah. but I mean, you, but you can look at, you know. Like everything that happens in life, I mean, we've all been in situations where, like, let's say we, you work at a at a job somewhere, and you know, you might have that co that coworker who kind of stabs you in the back to 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 get ahead, you know, like that's that's Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, you know, <laughs> right. that, 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 that story right there, you know, like, there, there's. Like, you know, there's these real life things that you sort of experience and there's probably a wrestling parallel to it. And, um, and you know, and we sort of like to sort of, and I think that's the same reason people gravitate to like comics. I mean, you, you sort of see parallels of yourself in this other media form that, uh, that you're indulging. Um, and, but yeah, yeah, I agree completely. You know, there's, um, Everything sort of recycles itself, and um, you know, like there's so many various wrestling storylines, old and new, that you know might have a striking resemblance to right. people you know, something you've gone through. Um, you know, it's like I could, like I played a, I played a show um, a few months ago where. You know, I was supposed to go on at a certain time, but the the opening act took, you know, went way over his time. Right over time. <laughs> and then, and then I was just thinking of, oh man, like, so that's what so and so felt like when <laughs> them them bloodline segments go forty five minutes <laughs> on the show. You, you know, and right. it, like there, there's there's a parallel to literally everything. <laughs> Yo, who was there? Was there anyone in particular that introduced you to to wrestling, or did you just, just did you discover it on your own? Um, I mean, for me, um, I mean, I kind of just caught it on TV, um, and I just thought like, yo, this is this is pretty unique. This is pretty cool. Um, and then I saw it a uh, you know a few more times, and you know, I, I didn't at least at the time I didn't know that you know, wrestling was like a thing or that it was really big. Right. So I, I, I just remember going to school um, and I think I overheard someone talking about uh, Ric Flair or Rick Rude or Hulk Hogan or something. And I kind of overheard like, oh, yo, you, you guys watch wrestling? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, man. Like every, everyone does. And um, which and leading into like the attitude era where like everybody was tapped in on, on some degree. Um, 
so you know it was kind of like validating like oh okay this this thing that i'm thinking is cool is not as silly as as maybe i initially thought it was right I guys saw- don't mind my camera no you good um oh, okay. i saw wrestling for the first time when i was like i said probably about five years old or so because my grandfather right. would watch it occasionally but I had a, a, a momentary interest in it, but it wasn't until I was a little older, like I said, around 95 or so, that I kind of saw it on TV and, it, you know, just it hit different the second time. And, yeah. you know, met some kids at school who, you know, kind of had the same passion for it. And I was in a backyard wrestling federation, you know, when hey! I was in high school. Hey! <laughs> and the, 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 the fun, like the hilarious part about it was – When I was little and would try to put wrestling on the TV, my mom hated it and would tell me to turn that off. It was silly. When I get to high school and I'm actually actively backyard wrestling and I'm not going out and getting arrested and, you know, I'm my mom is realizing that, like, hey, he's actually just working on his submission holds and things like that. (laughs) Then all of a sudden, you know, she was with it. And she starts trying to learn, you know, who all the different workers are, you know, who's dope and who sucks and, you know, things of that nature. So, you know, they could only afford one or two pay-per-views a year, which we'd usually get uh, Royal Rumble and WrestleMania, unless WCW was doing something special. But then the others I would listen to, you've heard the term scramble vision, Oh, yeah. So yeah. I used to listen to pay-per-views on Scramble Vision like some, you know, World War II era man listening to a ball game on the radio. Like it was oh. that's how hungry I was for it at the time. So, it, you know, it wasn't until uh, it was mostly self-discovery. And, it, you know, but when when I fell in love, I fell in love hard with it. Like I was reading the actor magazines, the PWI Almanac, like all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. All that stuff. So, man, Crazy. when when I was coming up, when it came to wrestling, like I was introduced to wrestling through my dad. He was like this crazy wrestling fan. And at the time, the territory that was big in this area was AWA. Mm. So we had we actually had AWA showing on local television, like local cable. So you could like actually, you know, turn the channel to it, and. I just saw him watching it one day, you know, like what are they in swimming trunks and are they in a boxing rink and what's going on, you know, but I mean, he's, he's been a fan literally as far as back as I can remember. So I've seen him watch it for like my entire life. And I guess just having it around just got me into it. You know what I mean? He he took me to my first wrestling show at the old barn, the Winnipeg arena, AWA show. And I think it was game over at that point because it was like I'd been to a circus and it felt like a circus, but it's way cooler than a circus. And I, right. I think I think it was just at, it was game over. You know what I mean? I just I'm still watching it right now. <laughs> I was going to say it never goes away. It never goes away. I mean, we'll we'll probably we'll probably touch on it a little more um, later, but you know, having sort of finally gone to a to a live show for the for the first time um you know the the tv experience i feel like it doesn't really do it justice like i had so much fun just just being there and sort of you know you know sort of taking on the energy of the crowd and um you know so i i can imagine like the way that i felt after watching um a few live shows for the first time it's like you know, I, I remember just sort of being posted up right next to this dude and his probably four or five, maybe six year old um, daughter. And, you know, and she was so into the show. And, you know, and I remember when someone caused a ref distraction and the other guy runs in and hits the baby face with the belt and, and this this girl is just like losing it beside me and it's like <laughs> yo this is like this is so dope and yeah. you know and sort of over time and you know we're all quote unquote smart fans and you know, you know the, the, the insider lingo but yep. but just but just seeing such a pure reaction from someone who probably legitimately thinks it's real and it's like yeah like that like I almost forgot about that feeling um it, it's it's a beautiful thing, man. It, it's beautiful. Do both of y'all remember when you realized, oh, 
So it's not what I think it is. Um, uh, I think that, I mean, there is various, I mean, I remember like on the, the playground, you know, we'd be talking about wrestling and, you know, and there'd always be like the one person who had to make sure everyone knows like, yo, you know, this is fake, right? Yeah. And it's like, and it's like I, I remember hearing it and it's like, well, I mean, some of the punches they throw definitely, it feels like they should hurt them more or mm. why, why aren't these guys like bleeding? Like how do they get up so quick? How do they get up so quick? And like, yo, the undertaker just dropped this guy on his head. How is he alive? You know, but you know, but when you're invested in something um, and part of your emotional investment is believing that it's real, um, you know, you try to, at least I tried to, sort of just ignore it and, you know, you sort of make justifications like, well, maybe there's a rule that you can't do a close fist punch or maybe, maybe he, maybe these guys just miss their forearms or something. You know, <laughs> I, I made all kinds of excuses and, you know, and this, and this was around like, I think like around the, uh, just leading into the attitude era is when it's like, okay, they're, there's there's something to this, but I still believed it was you know it was competition, and you know you get to the Attitude Era and you know Vince Russo and the whole this whole Crash TV philosophy. <laughs> and it's like okay, Woo! there's 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 like there's no way around it. Like this this is obviously not real, but I'm still kind of entertained by it, you know. <laughs> I was deeply emotionally conflicted by this question from about mm. 1995 to about 1998 on the mm. grounds that the only thing I've ever considered as a career option in my life, aside from wanting to do music, was I briefly wanted to be a wrestler. And that. so I remember, you know, as L elaborated on there was always playground kids, somebody trying to make sure that you know that they thought it was fake. And being that I was the kid walking around with the PWI almanac, I would try to counter argue that by saying, well, no, Dr. <laughs> David Schultz slapped the life out of John Stossel over this question. Mm -hmm. And there was a real lawsuit and he really busted yep. his eardrums. Yep. And, you know, I'd be, I'd be talking, I'd be making reference to old things Lawler did in Memphis and, <laughs> you know, really trying to argue and ride for it. And I remember being conflicted thinking to myself, like, this is me alone in my thoughts thinking, well, what if it is fake? And so I remember at the time, my like solution to this matter was like, well, I'll learn how to do all the moves. <laughs> there I'll you learn go. how to really do all this stuff just in case it's not. And then if I get there and it's fake, then, you know, I'll, I'll be okay. That was my, you know, 16 year old logic. But then as time gets on, like near, the, you know, by the time I'm getting ready to graduate high school, we're well into the attitude era and we have the Montreal screw job and things like that. And I'm like, uh, you're making this difficult on me. And you know, <laughs> then I kind of fell back in love, you know, with the idea of wanting to do music. And, you know, that was the end of me wanting to be a wrestler. But that was that for a few years. That was like something I really wrestled with, <laughs> like right. not knowing. So how, how long did you train for, man? I I you gotta call it training loosely, but um <laughs> for about maybe three years, I would say through Damn, okay. ninth ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade. Uh okay. I, I used my little money working at the grocery store to get some wrestling mats. And I had a younger brother who, you know, wanted to be a wrestler too, and we would practice moves on each other. And, you know, my homeboy had a makeshift ring and uh things like that so you know i obviously like i'm my body frame is not really built to be a pro wrestler um you know so i, I would call it training loosely but uh you know i do i can take a flat back bump on stage oh, and not sick. hurt myself that is sick. uh but as time goes on like by the time backyard wrestling because you got to understand something you know to touch on something else you know, said earlier is like, there was a time like being a wrestling fan was really uncool and taboo yeah. and yep. you were not cool if you were into this. So, yep. you know, 
saying that to say when I was in a backyard wrestling federation, it was very, huh? Ooh, you know, by the time backyard wrestling comes, you know, b b becomes fashionable, I'm seeing these other local kids and like they're blading. Like, they're, <laughs> they're kidding. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, oh, man. At that point, I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe we we're going too far now. Oh, wow. That's crazy. That's wow. So nuts. <laughs> That's why, yo, L. Did you ever entertain the thought of, you know, hopping in a ring? Uh, no. Uh, well, no, not never. serious, not seriously. Yeah, I mean, okay. we, um, you know, I mean, we we would always, um, especially in the winter time, and um, you know, there would be like like lots of snow, snow yeah. outside. <laughs> so you know, recess, we would, you know, we would have these oh, like, yeah. you know, like play wrestle matches so you know if i tried to suplex someone onto like the you know the, the, the snow at least it you know like no one would be hurt or anything like that but i mean we didn't really know what we were doing i mean when i got to high school and so at this point we're you know we're well into the attitude era kind of transitioning to ruthless aggression and um and some some friends of mine who um kind of went to a different school. Like, yeah, they had the whole um, backyard um, federation. Oh, and nice. I mean, they, they didn't, they didn't do it for particularly long, but they, they videotaped like all of them. And oh. so, um, you know, I'd heard about it and like, Oh, I, I heard, I heard you guys wrestle. Like, well, what was the deal? They, and they let me borrow one of their tapes and, um, and yeah, I mean, it's just, amateur as it gets but i mean they were really trying to do stories and um i want to help me uh i guess they they planned this whole story arc where you know he was on a losing streak and and he, he was really losing his way and that sort of led into into his heel turn and and he turned his back on his crew like 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 bros like really like thought out like the the, the stories That's and everything sick. and i That's thought sick. like yo this this is the dopest thing in the world. Like when, like when you guys like doing another one, like I want to, like I want to like just be there to just watch it, you know? Um, Yo, homie was like a baby TK. Basically. Yeah. I yeah, mean, they were, that's sick. like, it, it was cool. Yeah. Cause beyond just the actual, you know, wrestling nature of it. I mean, they, they were trying to book, um, which, uh, which I thought was dope. Now, like most things, you know, people, sort of latch on to something and then you know guys get girlfriends guys want to focus on other things some of them played basketball or football or other sports and i think they only really did like i guess two like tapings before everyone kind of just did their own thing that's so sick though um yeah but it's um you know i feel like everybody has like i, I don't know too many people Whose whose wrestling fandom has has been super strong all the way through, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like you know I kind of started off pretty pretty excited for it. Attitude Era slash Nitro. I got really excited. I kind of fell the fuck off after uh, about like oh four. Okay, you know. And, you know, kind of keeping up with it just loosely, mm -hmm. sort of came back to it, you know, in the early 2010s with, like, you know, Danielson and Punk. But that was also my introduction to, like, ROH and just indie wrestling and, you know, Japan and so forth. And, you know, <laughs> so it's kind of gone up, down, up, down. I'm kind of, like, I'd say maybe at my most emotional <laughs> best. Um, since I was a kid, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's been a journey. What about you, Jake? How has my fandom changed over the years? Yeah. Do you find well, that, do you find that, you know, you had a starting point, you had that drop off and then you kept no, back I, in or was it? I agree step? with, I, I agree with what Elle says. I think just about every wrestling fandom <laughs> is cyclical to some degree. Like, you know, just like I, the business. I, I jumped into it with both feet, you know, listening to pay-per-views on Scramble Vision, you know, practicing my submission holds. 
then you get to a point where you kind of run out of gas. And, you know, when I moved to New York in 06, I went maybe four years without watching any wrestling, <clears throat> hardly. Um, from there, when things start coming around, like the WWE Network and, uh, you know, the wrestling podcast, you know, the many that we have now, I start finding ways that I can work wrestling back into my life, uh, you know, and keep it close to me without having to necessarily uh, watch a lot of programming you know, oh, yeah. that I might not be interested in. Now, to some degree, I think I may have taken that too far because I know I have missed some good stuff in recent years between you know, New Japan or some of the stuff AEW has been doing and things like that. But, you know, I, I did within the last maybe four or five years have heavily regained, you know, I don't have a lot of quote unquote downtime, you know, with, mm -hmm. with everything I'm working on at any given point. But mm -hmm. if I do have downtime, you, you're more than likely going to catch me with something on the WWE network or I'm listening to a podcast or, you know, uh, and and it's even kind of worked its way in not to over philosophize the matter um or to sound like the guy who's in therapy but <laughs> immersing myself in wrestling has like almost become self-care to a degree because okay. it allows me to it allows me to go back to a time where kayfabe was alive where i'm kind of able to suspend you know my beliefs and yep. and my disbeliefs you know and and be entertained and and just get back to a time where like the problems could be solved by good versus evil as opposed to this apocalyptic nightmare that we live in currently yeah, i like your point uh your point. you know so i by even if it's just me taking an hour to watch some old pay-per-view that's an hour that like i'm not stressing or not worrying about something or not you know uh it's it's very it's escapism and, Oh, it's escapism. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I just consider wrestling part of my self-care routine now. And, you know, so, okay. but I, I agree, gotta, it goes in cycles. Well, I, I got a question for both of you. Um, and I was having this conversation with a friend of mine the other day. Um, now, when you watch wrestling now, whether it's like current or new content, or you're kind of revisiting something from, from back in the day or, or whatever, um, so now that we're all quote unquote smart fans or smarks, um, <laughs> I hate that term so much. Um, but are you able to are you able to watch any form of wrestling nowadays and sort of turn off the analytical smart part of your brain, where you're like, you know, where you kind of like see the wires? Like, can you kind of just invest in it like the way that you could when you were a kid? Current wrestling, not at all. Like, I will be viewing it through the lens of, well, they botched that, or, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, to some degree, to some degree, uh, I can watch old wrestling that way, although I do have a higher radar for if, you know, for just things that are out of the ordinary, things I would not have caught if you're not a smart fan or you don't learn how to recognize someone course correcting a mistake in the middle of the ring. Like right. sometimes with older wrestling, I'll be able to pick that stuff out, but it's a little bit easier for me to just sit back and, and watch the show. And, you know, if I'm watching new stuff, I'm, I'm, it's almost like I'm backstage in the gorilla position. I'm, right. I'm just overanalyzing everything. And maybe that's the X factor is that I can't turn off. I can't turn kayfabe back on in my mind, I guess. Right. I think, right. I think that's a great point. Um, I love how you said it's like you're in Gorilla because literally that's what it feels like watching any new wrestling product. It feels like you're in Gorilla and you're analyzing going, oh, hey, so was that supposed to happen? Oh, that looked like that was a miscue. And you know what I'm saying? Like, it's really hard to just watch it now. Right. Like I um, and I wasn't even talking like just like the, the actual like in, you know, in ring. It's like, you know, they might, like, for instance, on AEW, um, they just did, a, you know, a, a tournament for the yeah. the Owen Hart yeah. uh, Foundation Cup. Yeah. And it's like, you look at, and, you know, you're looking at the brackets, and it's like, oh, it's going to be CM Punk versus uh, <laughs> Ricky Starks in, in the end. 
like no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, you're just sort of looking at, um, you know, how the show is booked and who has moment, mo- more momentum and who's more yep. over and, yep. and yada, yada, yada. And it's like, man, if I was watching this when I was like five, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I come to that same conclusion because, you know, you're just looking at it solely from under the eyes of, you know, someone who, who believes these guys are really getting in a fight. Like, yo, Hobbs is bigger than all these dudes. He, he should, he should walk all over them, but, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, and sometimes it's like, I, I try at various times to, you know, like not get involved in, in wrestling Twitter and, yeah. and some, and some of the, um, some of the dirt sheet shit, like shout out, shouts out to, um, you know, Sean Rossap and Fightful and some of those guys, they do great work, but sometimes it's just like, yo, like I, sometimes I feel like knowing too much is, you know, it, it, you know, everyone loves the tea and everyone wants to kind of like, you know, know everything, but you know, sometimes there's a, sometimes not knowing makes the product more fun and I'm a little at odds with, with it sometimes. It's very true. That's why I like it when when we get swerved. Yeah, and that's why I love the swerve. I'm glad you brought that up because it's like the one thing I notice wrestling fans like anytime anything happens that they don't have the answer for, and the immediate thing is, oh, it's a work, it's a work, or, or or so forth, and it's just like, yo. If, if I get worked, like, like, you salute, well, like right. I'm, thank I'm, you. You're, yeah. you're thank doing you. what you should. Yeah. Like, I like, like I, I like when there's a pay per view or something happening and I have no idea what's going to happen. I like when they, you know, and especially in this era where everybody knows everything, they do something that we don't see coming. Um, and you know, and people sort of get angry about it. Like, how, how dare you work me? Like, I, <laughs> I, you know, I follow PWI, so I, I should know exactly what happened. It's like, no, like I, I, I encourage folks to to work me, and some, and you know, yep. I, right. I try not to. I never read spoilers. You know, I, I, I don't want to know what happens on anything. Um, until I see it for myself. Sometimes, you know, you just sort of see it by accident. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's never been harder for performers to successfully work people. And, you know, when MJF does some, some wild shit, you know, like I'm hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I think... I think the one thing that that I found the easiest way to return to that suspension of disbelief is to watch it live Mm -hmm. because with no commentary and just the crowd and the action in the ring, you can kind of let that suspension of disbelief, you know, take over a little bit and you just get lost in it for a couple of hours. Whereas the television product, you're just going to analyze that shit to death. Right. Like, and I mean to death. (laughs) <laughs> well yeah and it, it's and it's always wild when you you go to a live show and you know you walk away like oh this was this was dope or i like this match or such and such and you know and i might go back and a few days later i might just like watch the the the, the tv broadcast of it and you know on on the broadcast or on commentary there's all these story tidbits that they're giving you which you know you don't get in the arena and sometimes there's promos and segments that you don't see when you're you know when you're live and it's uh you know it's almost it's more it's almost more pure that way and you have to sort of rely more on you know physical in-ring storytelling than you know Excalibur or (laughs) <laughs> Michael Cole or whoever, and, you know, kind of holding your hand through the through the whole story beats, you know. Well, we're we're gonna get into a little like a little bit of a uh, like brand by brand like conversation right quick. But before we do, uh, I wanted to get your opinions on one particular thing when it comes to wrestling. I mean, wrestling 
and we've talked about the origins. We know, you know, it, it basically came out of the Barnum and Bailey like tent, right? And and it's an American pastime that, woo, blew the fuck up internationally. And back in the day, people used to liken it to the male soap opera. And at the time, I thought it was a good, you know, it was a good way of referring to it as you're right, it is a male soap opera. But now, I think it's transcended that, like incredibly i think it's long transcended just being um, a male soap opera because the amount of money that people are making now in wrestling i've never seen anything like this before you could be an indie wrestler and if you're good and if you can market yourself and you can talk you got a chance you know what yeah. i mean you've got a yeah. chance yeah and i mean like uh like Cody Rhodes used to talk about it. I mean, I'm, I know he's making way more now, but yeah. at you know, but he was saying his first year or two of his indie run after he left uh, WWE to go. Oh, I I was I made more money just hustling the, the indies and you know New Japan and stuff like that than you know than you know his his stardust days and so forth and. Uh, you know, like Matt Cardona talks about that shit all oh the time. God. Him and um, and Steph, Steph Delander, like yeah, like they they make way more than they did, you know, in the the, the big machine. Yep. And um, but I mean, yeah, but I mean, and Matt Cardona in particular, like he, I think he figured out very quickly that you know, like anyone can just have a wrestling match, but. You know, he's really smart and creative with um, how he sort of generates his own buzz. Um, and so while I think he'll probably end up back in WWE one day, probably. Uh, he, he never has to go back. He's, no. he's killing it, and he, he doesn't need the machine. He can make his own schedule. He can do whatever he wants. Yep. I Jake, think that's why, why do you think, oh, why do you think it's why do you think it's had... I mean, just if you compare wrestling now, man, like now in 2023, even to the Attitude Era, like what wrestling is now is is a completely different beast. Well, it is. I, I think this is yet another parallel that the wrestling business draws with the music business. There you go. That, you know, in, in both of their previous eras, there was kind of a wall between quote yep. unquote us and them. Like you were either signed to the WWF or WCW or you were a struggling indie wrestler making $25 a night in a high school gymnasium for 10 or 15 people. That's and the music business used to kind of be the same way. If you weren't in the major label system, you were generally viewed as a scrub, you know, an unsigned wannabe, you know, pick your favorite, uh, you know, pick your favorite term. But, uh, you know, in the same way that we now have more tools at our disposal to break those walls down and reach our audience directly, an indie wrestler can go on Twitter now and say, hey, I'm now taking bookings. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in the past, like the, the, the wrestler wouldn't have even been involved in that conversation. There would have been two promoters calling one another from some exactly. smoke filled room to some yeah. other smoke filled room saying, hey, I got such and such. And they would trade talent. So it's one of those things where you kind of don't have to sit around and wait to be chosen anymore. You can take these matters into the, your own hands a little bit more. So, you know, and even on the same token, like, you know, wrestlers, I wrestlers have always been able to sell merch to the point, you know, they call them gimmicks. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I don't think for a long time it occurred to a lot of wrestlers that they should be pressing up and selling their own merch. Right. So, you know, in the same way that, you know, people like Eloquent and myself live in our own little ecosystem of the music business where there's a community of people who care about what we do and we kind of, yep, yep. you know, stay afloat by reaching these people directly. You can do that now as a wrestler, you know, without having to worry if Vince McMahon thinks you're marketable enough or <laughs> exactly. you know, if Eric Bischoff likes you. So exactly. I, I think that's a good thing. Because you know that allows more people to you know to put some to food eat. on the table. Yeah. So yeah. And more people eat. Hell yeah, definitely. Now, if I were if I were to like say, fellas, like, let's going out to a show. 
Let's go to a show. We're all having to be in the same market for some crazy reason. <laughs> Let's go to a show. And it, and it just so happens on that same night, AEW, GCW, WWE, Impact, Defy. Let's just go those five for now because those are the most you know, notable and most talked about, I find. They all happen to be running a show the same goddamn night. And we all happen to be in the same goddamn city at the same time. Which one do you guys want to go to? I mean... That scenario you painted isn't yeah, yeah. All that, isn't all that off. I mean, no. like Wrestle, WrestleMania weekend. That's you know, that's basically they'll literally can all run shit like yeah. all within a day or two of one another. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I mean, out of all of them, um, I mean, for me, probably now assuming these are just regular shows and not like house shows yeah house shows like wrestlemania or some shit these are house um um now i've only i've only been to um, a handful of aew shows but i mean i've heard the i've heard the gcw shows go go pretty crazy um Mm -hmm. so i definitely love to check check one of those but okay it's i don't know it's kind of one of those you know what? What am I in the mood for? Right. Um, at various times, the each respective company's you know changes in terms of intrigue and hotness. You know, like WWE's selling everything out; ticket prices are insane. Uh, lately, I've always been you know a, a bigger AEW guy, but you know I kind of love that outlaw spirit of gcw um and defy's been doing some crazy stuff too right so it's it, it's hard i mean it could just come down to flip, flip a coin flip, right. flip it a few times but uh you know if that present if that opportunity presents itself today um i'm probably checking out defy or gcw i totally forgot mlw by the way no disrespect to MLW. Yeah, I mean, well, it kind of leads to another uh, another interesting thing. I mean, we just spent a bit of time talking about, you know, how, you know, just profitable it is for indie guys and how everyone's just making more money and that's a beautiful thing. But it's like, I mean, I went from, you know, like I was watching kind of just only WWE for a while um, the early era of NXT, I used to watch the hell out of it. AEW's been great. I'm I'm getting back into New Japan. It feels like there isn't enough hours in the day to sort of keep up with everything. No. Um, I guess it's a good problem to have, but yeah, man, it is so hard. So to flip a coin, keep, flip a coin, <laughs> flip a coin, indeed. Okay. Hundred <laughs> percent, Jake. What are you saying? Which show? Uh, given that scenario and those choices, I think I would probably go with New Japan on the okay. grounds that I have seen the WWF, WWE, depending on what year it was. I, I've been to WWF shows seven or eight times, I'd say, mm-hmm. over the years. Uh, and you know, as out of the loop as I am with their current product, like I did back when we were actually trading VHS cassettes, used to watch a lot of New yeah. Japan. Uh, yeah, yeah, and getting access to you know New Japan cassettes as a Tennessee teenager was like you know finding the Ark of the Covenant at that time. So I would love to actually just see New Japan live, um, right. you know, before you know the, the apocalypse. Um, so that would probably be my choice given that scenario. Okay. Of all the shows that that y'all have seen up to now, which show stands out to you the most? Um, for me, I was fortunate enough to see um, the AEW um, New Japan Forbidden Door two. I hate um, you. Yes. So that, <laughs> Man. I mean, I, I knew that I was. It was in your market. Enjoy. No fair. <laughs> I, 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 I got lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the only pay-per-view that I've seen live. And, I mean, I knew it was going to be a good show. Like, at the time I bought tickets, um, there was literally nothing on the, nothing announced. So I kind of just trusted that they'll, you know, put together a good card. And it was a good card, but, you know, seeing um, Kenny and Will Ospreay 
throw down mm-hmm. for like 40 minutes or whatever it was. I mean, that was absolutely unbelievable. I mean, the event could have been just that singular match and I, I wouldn't have complained. Um, so that and the other three shows I've seen, I've seen a couple dynamites. Um, I saw a collision show, which was, uh, which was a lot of fun, like the day before forbidden door. Mm. Mm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that was definitely the craziest show that I've seen. For Jake. me, uh, so this is weird, but it's a random WCW house show from Ooh. 1999. Ooh. In Ooh. Let's go. Oh. Now, the they, 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 they didn't do too many of, uh, they didn't do a lot of house shows back then. Damn. No, they didn't. Uh, we were just enough in their territory that we would get WCW house shows, but the significance of that house show was not even the wrestling that occurred that night. It was the fact that I rang up Chris Benoit's groceries the following day. Oh, Let's go. Oh my God. So <laughs> what? Okay. Holy shit. So I'm a teenager. I have a song with Rock Marciano actually called Manila Envelopes. It's on about three albums. Let's ago. go. And oh I talk God. about it in this song. I have a little bar where I mention it. But uh, so what basically happened was this: is that you know. Following day, I'm uh, on duty at the, there was a chain of supermarkets in Tennessee called Ingalls, and I worked at Ingalls. And so off in the distance, you have to understand, like in East Tennessee, we did not have celebrity sightings. It's, you know, in the time I've lived in New York, you get very desensitized to it because you see people all the time. But in Tennessee, anyone who was on the quote unquote television was just not someone you ran into in real life. So. I'm, I'm, I'm manning the cash register bored to death. And I see someone in the distance and I'm like, he looks like Chris Benoit and starts walking closer, pushing a grocery cart. And I'm like, he really looks like Chris Benoit. All of a sudden, Chris Benoit and Nancy, who at that time was woman who was rolling with the four horsemen. And, you know, we had no idea that, you know, they were shoot together. Um, so, oh. you know, I, it, and this was the funny thing about kayfabe was at that time, I was mildly confused. Why was woman yeah, like, Chris what, Benoit? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't question it because Benoit was a horseman. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, point being, they, I see them pulling their grocery cart into my, my checkout lane and I'm hyperventilating. Because I'm like, oh my God, I'm I'm four feet away from now. I understand today for obvious reasons, being a Chris Benoit fan is a very complicated matter and not something that people generally want to proclaim too loudly. But at that time, he was in my top five dead or alive. He's and he's you know, alive. especially if you're a smaller guy who wants to be a wrestler, he's the man. Come on. And so Point being is that they they by the time they get their cart to my aisle, some of the ladies who worked in the bakery had caught wind he was there and come running over trying to get autographs from Benoit. Now he very quietly is like, yeah, no problem, and he's signing autographs. Well, there was a 80-something year old gentleman named Harry that worked at the supermarket who goes, Who the hell is he? Before anyone can say anything, teenage Jake goes, That's Chris Benoit. <laughs> I said, he debuted in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada in 1988 as the Wild Pegasus. Oh, yo! You smart him up. Chris Benoit is holding a piece of paper, signing an autograph, and looks at me both impressed and totally creeped out. And he goes, damn, you know you're wrestling, huh? And I didn't say anything because I was shook. Oh, my God. They bought a loaf of bread, some sandwich meat, and they briefly made these Lay's chips that had like a Lestra. It was like some kind of fat substitute that they later, you know, it found out it killed people and gave you cancer. They bought a bag of those chips. (laughs) And then they left. Um, Oh, my God. Now, in in hindsight, what clearly happened is that WCW was in Knoxville the night before. They were on the way to the next town. They stopped at the supermarket, and I just happened to be the one got to ring them up. But that moment floored me because that was the first time I'd ever seen someone from the other side of the television in real life. And I was able to impress slash alarm him with my knowledge of their work. 
uh, Jake, man, that's 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 story that's still fire. Floors. Yeah. <laughs> that story still floors. Okay, I'm still kind of like, holy, what the? Did that just happen? Whoa, yo, L man, you got any interesting one on one situations? Um, he's like, yeah, a couple. <laughs> well, I'm well as far as anybody like connected to to pro wrestling. I no, I don't think I. I mean, after uh, Forbidden Door, I, you know, I crossed path. I crossed paths with uh, Aubrey Edwards, but oh, yo, no, nice. you know, nice. like, yeah, she, she was really nice, but it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't really like a noteworthy story in, in any in any particular way. I mean, I've I've crossed paths with, you know, like rappers and producers and hey, it's funny uh jake you mentioned kind of being in new york and you know everyone's sort of just like so desensitized to it and i remember one of the last times i was in new york um because uh i had a show there as part of a small tour and i remember we're at just some coffee shop i uh, mean the some of the other guys on the show and uh one of the guys is like hey uh hey look behind you and like I just turn around and like, oh shit! Like there's there's Questlove, you know, fro and all, right. and you know, and I'm I'm kind of like geeking out, but then it's like, you know, I'm, just, I'm trying to like angle my phone in a way where I can kind of like <laughs> catch him, <laughs> and then I and then I kind of just like, you know, what? like no, let me let me not be that guy. I'm way too old to to kind of you know be doing that shit and. <laughs> You know, and he's, and, you know, I figure, you know, this guy probably, he probably gets mobbed quite, quite a bit. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to be that, that guy, but, yeah. you know, but it was like, oh, like, yeah, bro's literally like four feet away from me. Um, so that's crazy. Yeah. You know, at, at the time it's like, you know, this, I mean, he might have been one of the most famous people I've come across. Uh, you know, sometimes it's it's sort of a you know don't meet your heroes sort of sort of oh, thing. Yeah. Oh, um, so some, that's, sometimes, that's <laughs> well, and I've sort of come to realize over time, it's like you know it's some you know sometimes it's like you know you'll just meet people organically and you'll have a cool moment, kind of like yours yeah. with uh, with with Benoit, but. Um, you know, I try not to to get too too up um, before meeting someone because I think we've all had those situations where you meet someone and they're not nearly as cool as they come across. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Oh, on TV yeah. Or, or online, and it's like more right, times I than I care to say. Yeah, and it's and honestly, it's just like one of like my biggest heroes like musically like inspired me in terms of production and you know i kind of found out that he's kind of a dick and it's you know from from that day on it's just like all right let me uh never never meet my heroes or at least go out of my way you know if it happens it happens but you know I hate people I mean, these are regular people and people regular people, people you man. come across. <laughs> regular people you come across are some sometimes yeah. assholes. It, it right. just is what people, it is. People. <laughs> Speaking of assholes, back in the Attitude Era, there was a WWE. I, I'm sure it was a house show that came through this market, and we were in a hotel that wrestlers usually stayed at because we were there for a party. We we're actually there for an 18th birthday celebration. Uh, a debut, 18th birthday debutante's ball, okay? And it was my homie's sister's debutante's ball. So we're, we're kind of wiling in the in the hotel, you know, we're drinking, you know, just being a bunch of stupid kids, right? We open up the elevator and standing in front of us is Mick motherfucking Foley. And we didn't, we, we, like, we legit didn't know it. <laughs> we got in, obviously. <laughs> but we're just like, is anyone going to say anything? No one said shit. We all just like, you know, face forward in the elevator. We're like, is anyone going to say anything before we get off this elevator? And you could tell. We were all looking at each other. Like, someone say some shit. No one said shit. Elevator door opens. I finally turn around and go, yo, you're Mick Foley, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
just have to make sure. <laughs> he's like, yep. Yeah. Like, just chill. He's like, yep. Yeah. Like, I get this all the time. Yep. You know? I'm like, awesome. Thanks. <laughs> and we're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. But remember, we're in the hotel where they're obviously staying. So, in the hallway, we see the Harris brothers. Remember the Harris brothers? Yes. <laughs> Jacob and Take Eli Blue. <laughs> Creative they're control. Tall, they're tall and they're big. That's all right. I'm gonna say. So okay, again, you know we're kind of wilding. So, so some some of the fellas been getting their drink on. Someone found out where they were staying, and fucking called pizza to their fucking room. <laughs> ordered them pizza randomly. Ordered them pizza. Like we need to order this. I'm like, no, no, it's for you. Someone ordered them pizza, and we happened to be right there. When it happened, <laughs> because it was one of my boys that did it. <laughs> we're like, fuck, you ordered a pizza and we're standing right here for him to get the pizza? Are you fucking serious? Man. Yeah. And then to finish off that weekend, because it was a weekend, Sunday morning, I guess obviously they're getting ready to fly out. We're hungover as hell. We're in the lobby getting all our stuff out. Undertaker walks by. We're like, are you fucking serious? But we're hungover and shit, okay? So no one gives a fuck anymore. Like, no one's going to mark out. It's just like, yo, it's the fucking Undertaker. Okay, cool. <laughs> and then on our way out, I see in the coffee shop, Shawn Michaels, Triple H, and China. I'm like, holy fuck, DX is in the fucking coffee shop, guys. I know we didn't say anything to Mick Foley when we were in the fucking elevator with him, but how are we not going to say something to DX? Right. So they're like, who's going to do it? I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to do it. I walked in there, and I'm like, I, why? And you know, you know when you're, as you're walking, you realize, maybe this is a dumb idea. <laughs> why am I actually walking up to these performers right now to mark out? But, you, you know, you get it closer to the table. You're like, okay, I'm getting too close. I can't back out now. And I meekly go, hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> and then they're just looking at me like, yeah, thanks. And, you know, like, the, at that point, DX is at their height. They're yeah. probably just tired. You know, they're on the road. I understand. At the time, I didn't. But I, looking back now, I know. The last thing they wanted to hear is, Fucking Sunday morning before the other flight, this mark coming out of nowhere to just start marking out. And all I can muster was, hey, so can I get an autograph? Triple H looks at me like, nah. Okay, fuck off. And I just walked away like, wow, fuck you. <laughs> I mean, I used like, to. Okay. Yeah, it's like I. I'm, I'm basically that exact same scenario um, with uh, with a, a rapper who shall be named, who shall be re re remain nameless, uh, many many years ago, and oh. I remember kind of just like really being in my feelings about it, and mm. kind of over time, it's like, man, I've I've done gigs or something, and I've you know just been exhausted afterwards. Like I just want to get back to my hotel and. Yeah. Yeah. You know, someone at, someone is asking me like, "Oh, what sort of EQ setting did you use oh, on that one god. joint you made nine years ago?" And it's oh like, my god! Oh, don't get the fuck, don't get the fuck out of here with that nerd shit. You know, I, I mean, I I'd say that, but it's like I've but I mean, I, I've, I, I've I've felt it, and so yeah. it's like I, I try I try not to judge people. Yeah. You know, by their, oh yeah, you know, in, in those moments where they might be like exhausted or whatever. Sure. Although, sure. you know, in my instance, it was sort of a, uh, yeah, like bro didn't really want to take a picture or sign yeah. an autograph. Okay, yeah. that's cool. I respect that's it. Yeah, um, only to like, you know, walk past him twenty minutes later, or he's like, you know, mobbed up by uh, by honeys. Um, like, outside the of the venue and it's just like <laughs> it's like fan that photo it's like i opened yeah. up for you that that, that photo yeah. would have taken five seconds and then you're on you know so it's, yeah. like, uh, it's like okay it, it, it is what it is but <laughs> but 
but I mean, especially it's nowadays, and, exactly. and you know, I mean, you kind of, you kind of keep hearing about, yeah. um, you know, all these wrestlers getting like mobbed at the airport and, you know, they're asked to sign like a hundred, 30, items. Auto- yes. 30 yeah, items, which all go up on eBay, like For five real? hours later. Yo, what if, what if both y'all dealt with that on the regular, honestly? Oh, like, I mean, like if this, if is- anybody, if anybody steps to me, and again, I'm not, I'm not famous like that, obviously. But, but somebody, I mean, but yeah, but somebody steps to me and is requesting um, thirty autographs, and they're trying to gaslight me into feeling like like I'm an asshole if I say no. Yeah, it's like no, get man. the fuck out of here. <laughs> nah. Yeah. In terms, in terms of of that type of thing, and it's like because I mean, obviously. Public figures, public figures. Like, there's no, you know, we, we, we all know the deal, right? Y'all public figures. That's just the way it is, right? And that's that's just part of being a public figure. Like, if a random is going to come up to you because you did something that somehow, you know, affected them in some way, then if they're feeling so inclined, they they might just come up to you and, and you know, ask you something like, what EQ did you use in WhatsApp? But that is literally a part of being a public figure and y'all knew that going into it anyway, you know, you just kind of, you just kind of like ride the wave as best you can. Right. Yeah. Right. You just have to, you, you have to remember to some degree, like those are the people that are keeping you in business and, exactly. you, know, uh, you know, they are owed a, a certain degree of courtesy. Now at the same time, that goes both ways. Like they're not exactly. allowed to go rush you exactly. at the airport with 30 exactly. items to sign. Oh, like, come on. You know, so, I mean, surely to God, like, there's some kind of comfortable medium in between, so. Well, I think I think that, that's why the cons are dope. Yeah, right. It's a little because, more structured and yeah. you know, a little more direct. Uh, exactly. You know. And, and to get so crazy. Everybody knows why they're there. You're in a controlled environment exactly. for the purpose of being able to fan out, you know, yep. Uh, yep. things like that. So, no, the, the, exactly. that's... That's definitely a dope space for that. So in terms of storylines, as we're as we slowly start to wrap things up, in terms of storylines, what storyline has stuck with you going into 2023 after X amount of years of, of enjoying this professional sports entertainment phenomenon? And and what storyline currently, so part one and part two, what storyline currently is just flames um so of all time and current so as far as current um the the bloodline storyline mm-hmm. admittedly is has been pretty yeah. has been pretty awesome now i'm also of the opinion that um it's kind of run for too long um, oh yeah jump and the need to they need to either end it or they need to do some new wrinkle because mm-hmm. I, I I just I feel like I feel like this is a story that while very well told they've really really dragged it longer than it needed yeah. to be yeah. you you've know you've wrung it out you've wrung it out right um, but I can't I can't you know pretend it's not it made the money certainly certainly by WWE standards and frankly I've not been a fan of their storytelling yep. for a very long time but that's but they killed it with that by and large they did a great job with that one yep. as far as um in general or all together um I think I'd mentioned the the HBK split um, I really like that story yep. um let's see um, I mean, the elite, or not them, um, I mean, CM Punk, uh, he had a, he had an awesome story with, um, Rey Mysterio back in his mm. WWE days, mm. the straight edge society shit. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. And I remember there was a, there's a promo in particular where, uh, Rey Mysterio and his family were in the ring saying their thank yous and shit and, Punk and Gallows and Serena Deeb come out and um, and <laughs> he's basically like telling uh, 
raise kids to their face that, yo, I'm going to, I'm about to beat the shit out of your old man. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that, that's one of my personal favorite ones. I mean, I know okay. there's, you know, everyone loves like the NWO and yeah. there's been a bunch of great stories over the years. I mean, those are kind of some, that one is a, probably a less or a more obscure one, but I always, you know, it always gravitated to me. I'm uh, I'm so out of the loop. I would say that the as far as current storylines, the only two that I'm you know I have become invested in in recent you know in the last year or two. Not to piggyback off what L said, but it would either be the bloodline or it would be the Rey Mysterio and Dominic angle. Okay, um, I thought that and was pretty good well executed. Hell yeah, um, good one. Yeah, yeah. I uh, b- because you know the thing is is uh. The storytelling got so far fetched for a while yeah. that you forget yeah. that sometimes the simplest things can have, yeah. you know, in this case, uh, you know, resentment between a father and a son and, you know, exactly. trying to prove, uh, you know, all that. I-, I thought that angle was pretty well executed. So, as far as contemporary stuff, those are the two that I've gravitated towards lately. Of all time, it's, it's, it's one of two. It's yeah. either. Probably when Bret Hart went away and then came back to face Steve Austin. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about WrestleMania 13. Okay. I'm talking about when Steve Austin and Bret Hart wrestled at the Survivor Series in right. 96. So right, right, right. Bret, had lost, uh, Bret had lost the Iron Man match to Sean at WrestleMania 12. I was crushed. Brett leaves to go, uh, you know, film Lonesome Dove and, you know, yeah. Asses, you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. he's not coming back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Steve Austin's star begins to rise during yeah. that time. You know, Brett comes back on TV and come to find out that was actually a shoot that, you know, Vince was not yeah. in the loop if he was yeah. going to resign or not. I so I was at the edge of my seat. Now, so when Brett decides he's coming back and he's staying with the WWF, of course, they put him up with Steve Austin. Now, in my mind, I was worried sick because Steve Austin was on a, a run at that time, you know, making his initial first run into superstardom. So when they got to the Survivor Series, not everyone talks about their WrestleMania match. I'm like one of the weirdos that actually prefers their match at the Survivor Series because it was okay. Steve Steve Austin had not hurt his neck yet. He could still right. do could still very good technical back. wrestling. Yeah. And uh, they paid a tribute at the end of that match to um, Bret Hart versus Piper at WrestleMania 8, where Bret was in a sleeper hold and he kicks mm-hmm. his feet off the ropes into a, a cradle. So saying that to say that when Bret came back and was able to get the better of Steve Austin, like my faith in life was restored. Okay. That day. Um, now okay. they turned him heel later and then, you know, the screw job yeah. happened. Yeah. Uh, the only other runner up that I would say I was maybe as equally emotionally invested in would maybe be Ric Flair and Terry Funk. Um, okay. When, you know, Funk broke his neck and then, you know, they had an incredible match at the Great American Bash and then they later had the I Quit match at the Clash of the Champions. Mm. Uh, I was really invested in that one, I would say. Okay. Okay. Going back to, to like early days, WWE, when they had their little uh, Jake the Snake versus Rick Rude and and uh, the wife got involved, and then oh. Rude put the wife on his tight. I'm sorry. That still to me is like, boom. Bro, that might be you the most put- dis- that might be yeah, the most disrespectful man. thing oh I've ever God, seen in wrestling. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what? oh. Like, Rick Rude, you need to get oh your ass whooped for that one. Yes, know? man. And did you not <laughs> want to see him get his ass whooped? Did you not want to see that happen? It was hit him up for his time. Ooh. Like, it was one of the coldest disses that ever uh, up to that loved point it. in wrestling. Like, loved it. Loved it. Loved it. That will always I, stand I, I, I forgot about that one. That, that, that one that was Because I love my diss tracks. I love my diss tracks. So I really... I got to I got to call back to their little run that they had together. And then in terms of current times, uh, I definitely got to give it up to New Japan because that kind of got me back into wrestling because mm-hmm. after the attitude area I fucked off. I I ruthless aggression, I couldn't say anything about. I had to catch up after the fact on a whole lot of shit. But when 
when the elite run in New Japan was really starting to pick up, I was introduced to that randomly by my homie. I'm like, y'all still watch wrestling? And they're like, yeah. Did you used to watch it? I'm like, yeah, when it was good. And like, oh, you think it sucks? I'm like, it does suck. Then they said, watch this. I'm like, oh, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and it reinvigorated my love of wrestling. So I, it's definitely going to the pre-AEW elite run in New Japan with Cody yeah. because that's yeah, also Cody. that's also how I got into Cody because I knew who Cody was from before. I had I'd already dropped out from when he was Stardust, but I still kind of knew, kind of like Jake, you know, you kind of still right. stay in touch. But that Stardust shit to me was like, yeah, that's why I don't watch that because no thank you, right? So to see this guy who was a WWE guy say, all right, I'm out and I'm going to do this my way and watch what I do. All I saw was like an indie rapper that said, fuck the majors. I'm going to go and fucking do this shit. So those parallels were so real to me that I hopped on the Cody train because I'm like, yo, I'm going to follow this because, yo, this literally reminds me of like a rapper that said, fuck the majors. I'm going to do this for right. Dolo. That's legit what I thought of. So it was hard not to get invested in it. You know what I mean? So yeah. it, was, it was that run, that pre-AEW New Japan elite run. Easy yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I known about new japan i mean yeah kind of keep hearing the name but right just think, like but i think that? it was just like you know i'd be watching like raw or smackdown and i'd be seeing people in the crowd with bullet club shirts and you know you'd see them like a lot and it's like mm -hmm. what the fuck is this bullet club thing that that i've never heard of um and you know you google it and you research it and like oh okay it's a thing in new japan oh Wait a minute. That, that's the guy from TNA that I really liked. Uh, <laughs> AJ Styles. Right. Oh shit. That guy's fucking awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, and they're throwing up like the two sweets and yep. it's like, oh, oh, this is okay. So this is basically New Japan NWO, but it's somehow like they just had their 10th, their 10th year anniversary like yep. uh, a couple months ago. Um, and, you know, kind of just through there, it's like, okay, um, oh, so these are the young bucks I keep hearing about who mm -hmm. all the all the old heads keep on, um, you know, keep on getting angry about, like, oh, they're ruining the business and they're super kicking people into oblivion. And it's like, you know, I, I kind of dig this. Exactly. I kind of dig this attitude of like, oh, like, fuck the It's a bit of a fuck you attitude. Yeah, it's a yeah, bit of a fuck you attitude. Yeah. So, like, I just not love that. Yeah, and then, you know, AJ leaves, and I'm hearing, like, oh, this, this guy, Kenny Omega, is, like, best wrestler in the world, and, you know, and it took me a while to sort of understand, because, you know, like, watching New Japan for the first time is kind of wild. Wow. Everyone, like, everyone is just, like, it's, like, super quiet and super yep. slow You're like, building. like, what's going on? <laughs> and everyone's just, like, applauding quietly. Um, like, what the fuck? Like, where's the crowd? Why, you know? And... But you, you kind of get it, and it sort of all leads to a yep. to a climax and to a crescendo. Um, oh, just as an aside, uh, have you what, have you peeped any of the G one this year? I haven't been following like crazy. I'm just kind of like paying attention to who's passing, but I haven't like watched well, any of the. So this is the first year that I've tried to like go hard on it. Legitimately sit down and like watch oh my it all. God. And Fuck, that's a lot. And I think I underestimated it. It's yeah, that's like a lot. it's 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 been good. Like the wrestling was great for the most part. I mean, some some of the matches are duds, but they basically they do like four episodes a week, um, and they're like three hours long a piece. It's I watched like the first like three fully through. Then it's like okay, I'm just gonna Ooh. go out of my way to watch. Eddie Kingston or yeah, Kazuchika yeah. Okada or some some yeah, of like yeah, my, yeah. my favorite guys and you know uh, uh, Naito just uh, yep. got crowned winner and you know I didn't see any of the playoff matches or the and yeah it's just like man it's I'm just genuinely having fun watching that tournament and it's great but I find New Japan very very hard to follow um it's group chat fodder 
honestly, it's like everyone okay, catches right. up through the group chat. <laughs> But honestly, for me, it's like, you know, I watch as much of the G1 as I can, which this year I probably watched maybe 65% of it, or usually it's like 20, 30. Um, It's like the G1 and then Wrestle Kingdom. And then, you know, if there's buzz about a crazy match, I'll, I'll try to catch it then. But, you know, it's... It's like I, I sort of vowed now that I'm, you know, kind of working from home full time um, between music and everything. It's like, all right, this is going to be the year that I catch up on all the wrestling that <laughs> I, I promised myself I was going to watch. But this year I'm going to do it. So I'm going to watch all this new Japan. I'm going to catch. I'm going to finally, you know, start watching Stardom, um, AEW. You know, I'll, I'll catch maybe the WWE pay-per-views and I'm going to catch some indie stuff. And there's people out there who do it religiously. Yeah. I don't know how they do it. I don't either. I don't they, There's not enough like, time of day. Right. Like I love like apart from music, um, wrestling is maybe like the next thing I'm super passionate about. And it's like I I, I, I tap out so early, like, yo, I, I need to <laughs> I need to stop man. watching wrestling and doing some other things to yeah. not not burn out of it. <laughs> it would it would have been it would have been great when we were younger to have access to all this shit now. You know what I mean? Because we had all the time in the world when we were younger. Well, I was yeah. going over the other day. I was having a conversation with somebody about what my week as a wrestling fan used to look <laughs> like when yeah, I was yeah, a yeah. teenager. And yeah. this was the weekly schedule. So on Mondays, you had Raw and Nitro. Right. And, you know, you were back and forth, tape one, watch one, whatever it was. By the time you got to Wednesday of the week, we used to get AWF Wrestling out of Chicago. It was a very oh, short-lived wow. promotion out of Chicago that was mostly nice. former WWF guys. They had a round mm. system in 96. Oh. Uh, so then by the time you get to Friday, EC, the original ECW, ECW. television yeah. would come on at 2 in the morning on Fox Sports South. Okay. So I would stay up till 2 in the morning to watch that, be <laughs> up at 9 a.m. on Saturday for WCW Saturday Pro at 9 a.m., WWF <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mania at 10 a.m., WWF Superstars at 11 a.m., oh WW, God. I'm sorry, WCW Worldwide at noon. Oh, my God. <laughs> Pause for six hours, then you get two hours of WCW Saturday night, wake up on Sunday, you have the WWF Action Zone at 12 noon, and then you had oh WCW Main Event at 6. So that was my week every week. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen hours of 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 cable television wrestling I used to consume a week. Man, you just dusted up all those old shows. <laughs> Like, whoa, yeah, you literally forgot about half the shows you just mentioned until you mentioned, like, oh my god, that's right, there were that many, you know, because they were like the house shows, they're literally just like you know, house show tapings, right? Sure, I wonder just... how I did that, like, how I did I know. commit to 14 hours of television wrestling a week? Damn, I guess I didn't have much to do back then, but it's like well, that, shit, because I mean, nowadays it's like, you know, and assuming now you're it's an investment, keeping, but now you're, you know, assuming you're only keeping it to what's on TV. Yep. It's three hours raw Monday. It's Jeez. two hours NXT Tuesday. It's two hours Dynamite Wednesday. Yep. Uh, Thursday there's Impact for two hours and maybe and Friday. ROH. Friday you have two hours Smackdown. SmackDown. Saturday now you have two hours Collision. Right. Yep. Uh, Sunday. Yeah. Well, occasionally pay per views, but I guess Sunday is your only break. It's your it's rest like, day. <laughs> and on the Sunday, it's, it's your rest day. Right? <laughs> and it's like, man, it's like I, I can only commit to, you know, I commit to to Dynamite and and Collision, and you know whether I watch SmackDown or Raw really just depends on, you know, if there's a match or something I'm interested in. But WWE also does this weird thing where um, they don't feel like you should know like what matches are happening until you actually watch the show. Right. <laughs> and it's like you know, it's like oh, you'll you'll find out. I'll find out on Twitter that oh shit, uh, Kevin Owens and Shinsuke Nakamura had a banger. So like, oh, yeah. I guess I'll I guess I'll go and look for it. But imagine if you'd advertised that, right? Like, right, yeah. and I I don't well, 
I was going to say I don't know why they don't do it, but you know, with you know, Vince changing his mind every like five minutes about the card, like yeah. ten minutes before the show, it's like, well, I guess it doesn't really make sense to advertise for it. Vince is a whole nother topic altogether. <laughs> we won't even we touch need a whole that. show for that. We won't even yeah. touch that one. That's a whole show. Um, Max. Yo, yeah, for real. Man, I really want to thank both of you. I, I, I very deliberately asked the both of you to participate in this because of the markets that you're in. Because I felt like we get some interesting perspectives because I know I'm in a wrestling market and I know both of y'all in wrestling markets or had, you know, wrestling markets in your background. So I knew getting these different perspectives would, would probably make for an interesting conversation. So I really want to thank y'all. But you. oh uh, before, thank you before for having you, me. Oh, it's been a pleasure. When I first brought this up to you guys on Twitter, I think I was like partly serious, partly joking. <laughs> and then it just dawned on me like, wait a minute, why couldn't we do hey, this though? Any, hey, man, anyone wants to talk graps with me, you know. <laughs> I'll there, be there. There, 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 there. There isn't any scenario where I say no to it. Right. So. <laughs> and it's like that. And on that note, I, I hope you guys are down to do this again. For sure. Yeah, just, okay. just uh, shine the bat signal. I'll be out here. We will, right. definitely, we will definitely do this again. Maybe we'll, 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 we'll like do topical shit. You know what I mean? Maybe that Vince episode will come out. Man. But I really want to, I really want to thank you That's both because this, this, this was a bit of a different podcast. We kind of went left, you know, we talk about hip hop all day, every day. And I felt like, Hey, you know, just because we love hip hop doesn't mean we can't talk about other things. Right. So I want to thank you both for for jumping the deep end with me on this one. It was dope. I knew it would be. Nah, it was my pleasure, man. Uh, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Now, of course, before you go, we got to get into current projects. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man, this is always such a, a tough thing. Cause it's like, I know. You know, <laughs> you know, I don't want to like announce things before... Yep. You know, before, we I the, before I get the green light, yeah, but we just want to know if it's working. Yeah, let's just say that I'm I'm keeping busy. I um I have a record that um a really dope record that I finished a few months ago. That um literally as we're on the air, I got a text from you know from the OG like, "Yo, it's go time." So hey. it's like, oh, okay, so I guess yeah. I'll be finding out a little more about it soon enough. Nice. Um, but yeah, there's a, a lot of things that uh, I'm working on right now. It's weird. Like this is going to be the first year in like 15 years or so where I likely don't put out a project, but that means that, you know, 2024 is going to be a very busy year. So, okay. Okay. Like it's, it's, on. it's on. It's on. Jake, I know you're like 24-7 busy, but is there anything... I have five jobs. Uh, you're always, so, man, what are you not working? <laughs> you know, I, I guess we'll run them down the list. As a rapper, uh, my latest album is called Plant-Based Libtard. It is available everywhere. Uh, we're pretty close to hitting a million streams on Spotify with hey. that one. So I'm going to try rah, to rah, 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 video rah. or two and try and push that over. Thank you. Let's uh, go. As a that. producer, uh, I've got the Solving Cases album out with El Sensei from yep. the Artifacts. Yep, yep. I've got an album dropping this fall with me and Lex the Hexmaster called Fire and Lead. Let's go. Um, as an engineer, I just mixed uh, Tony Touch new album on Def Jam called The Death okay. Tape. Okay. Uh, just mix the beat miners new album um and then you know on all of the above as as a producer rapper and engineer like i'm always working on something you yep. know so there's there's plenty Very more definitely. projects in the canon and kind of similar to what l just said like some of them i want to wait until they're a little closer to be of course to talk course. about but there's and, always something coming you know and y'all know when it's time to talk about it we're gonna hop back that, right here absolutely let's go absolutely that, you know that Fellas, once again, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yo, I was looking for forward to this. I knew it was going to be dope, and y'all just manifested that shit. Thank you so much. Let's thank get you, it. We'll come back for round two. Round two. Get ready for round two, y'all. Peace, guys. Thank you again. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Easy. Yes, sir.